Before, in, in between the downpours, uh, about 10 minutes before the last service uh, ended, it just poured. So I thought that I'd, they'd be, I'd have a captive audience for the rest of the day. They weren't leaving, but then the rain let up and they were allowed to leave. So I'm glad you made it here safely. I guess it's just storming in some places pretty badly. So just be careful today. And with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do pray for the safety of those out and about today, Lord. Uh, may you just uh, have your hand of blessing and protection over them. And Lord, be with us as we open the Word of God together this morning during this special communion service. Uh, be with us. Lord, guide us, enlighten us from what you have given me to give to these good people who have come to hear your Word. And we will give you all the honor and praise for doing so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And speaking of that... Number 82, Victory in Jesus, giving the Lord the victory. Number 82. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary. To save a wretch like me, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. And brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit then somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me The 
when we cut an album, I want that song on there. Okay, make a, make, make a mental note of that. Our, go- our gospel reading today comes from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. For your convenience, that passage is in your bulletin this morning. Please stand if you're able and, and comfortable standing as I invite Mrs. Campbell to the pulpit to lead us in this unison reading. Judge not that, that ye be, be not judged. judged. For with, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. judged. And with, with what measure ye make, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how, how wilt, wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine own eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. For today's lesson, I just randomly kind of picked Matthew chapter 7, because I realized I hadn't preached on this little passage in quite some time, maybe as much, many as 10 years, or I just preached on it last week. It's hard to tell with me. <laughs> the memory is just not there like it used to be. But this five-verse passage in Matthew 7 is a small part of a bigger lesson Jesus taught. The bigger lesson of Jesus is commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. What is the Sermon on the Mount? Well, it actually begins two chapters earlier. Uh, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1, And seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, went up into the mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. In other words, he, he made these, this group of people sit on the side of a mountain, and he taught them. And Jesus, seeing the multitudes, that they were eager and ready for his teaching, decides to take this moment this time and give them verse after verse, principle after principle, and doctrine after doctrine of what it means for them to be followers of himself, Jesus Christ. In fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount is three long chapters, chapters 5, 6, and 7 in the book of Matthew. Anyway, during his Sermon on the Mount, sometimes Jesus would relay commandments, sometimes he uh, corrects false doctrine, and sometimes, like in today's lesson, he gives really, really good advice. Our lesson today begins in Matthew 7, 1, as we just read. Jesus says, judge not that ye be not judged. And I think this verse is one of the most misused and misrepresented verses in probably the entire Bible. I've had this verse quoted at me a time or two in my past. Uh, once in a while, if I'm remarking about someone's poor life choices, or if I'm ge- talking generally about the downfalls of sin, or if I'm just drawing any conclusion about someone, uh, I've had a person or two in my past remind me, I'm surprised that you pastor. Don't you know the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. Now, such a statement to me is not wrong, but it's not always right. If by telling me not to judge someone, you're telling me that I shouldn't commend another who falls into, I'm sorry, condemn another who falls into sin, well, I would agree with that. It's not for me to condemn anyone else. I have a hard time just keeping my own life straight and on the narrow path. Uh, God will judge sin. God will condemn sinners. That's his job, not mine. Again, I agree. But if by telling me to judge not, that well-intentioned person means I shouldn't exercise wisdom and discernment and understanding, I would not agree with that at all. As a Christian, I am always to exercise wisdom and discernment, perceiving the sin of others and recognizing the pitfalls others have fallen into keeps me from falling into those same sins. That This kind of judgment keeps us in God's graces and steadfast in His will. When it comes to judgment, there's a difference between judging someone to condemn them to hell. By the way, I couldn't do that if I want to. I can't send you to hell. I can't send you to heaven. That is on you, and we'll get to that later. There's a difference between judging someone to condemn them to hell and judging someone's poor choices to draw conclusions that will be helpful in my own life. My father used to say all the time, um, it is a less expensive... uh, How how did that go? 
It's less expensive to learn by someone else's mistakes than it is to learn by your own mistakes. And I've always held that. If I see somebody making a mistake, I'm like, eh, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> they, 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 they're paying a price for a, for a choice they made. I see the result of that. Why would I make that same choice? I've, uh, I, I don't have much wisdom, I give you that, but I have at least that much wisdom that I do learn from other people's mistakes. In fact, if there's any success of me being a pastor at all, it's because I learn from other pastors' mistakes. Not from their successes so much, but from their mistakes. Anyway, this kind of judgment keeps me in God's graces. This discernment allows me to draw conclusions that are helpful in my own life. For instance, let me give you an example. How many of you parents would hire a known pedophile to babysit your children? You wouldn't. How dare you judge that person? Well, you see where I'm going. I'm talking facetiously. We should use the judgment of God gave, that God gave us to protect our innocent children. In fact, we should help any way we can to bring such a person to have them investigated, prosecuted, and convicted if they're guilty. We may even choose not to forgive this man, but the one thing we can't do as Christians is to condemn them to hell. That is for God to do. That is God's choice. That is for God to judge. Anyway, and by the way, if we don't, we don't have to wait for God to condemn sin. We don't have to wait for God to judge sin. We have his Bible, and his Bible tells us what he thinks about sin. God has already foretold his judgment on the unrepentant sinner. But anyway, during his Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is telling his followers to judge not, Jesus is not telling them and us to simply, oh, just live and let live, allow the chips to fall where they may, and just have a devil-may-care attitude. No. The Lord gave us a Bible, and the Lord gave us brains to process this Bible. If he wanted us to have no thoughts and just to live and let live, and to exercise no wisdom and to draw no conclusions, he would have left these pages blank. And we could have a lot of coloring to, to do in our, in our futures. These pages tell us right from wrong so that we don't have to judge sin. It's been judged for us already. The judging that we are commanded not to do is obviously condemning, avenging, drawing conclusions that are not ours to draw. You know, John 3, 17 tells us that Jesus' first purpose to coming, in coming to this world was not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then we have this wonderful story of the woman caught in adultery. I mean, it's wonderful for us. It wasn't so wonderful for her. Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees not to condemn. He said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Well, the woman caught in adultery was not stoned that day because nobody was in the place of sinless perfection where they could condemn that woman. Sure, they could judge her. Sure, they could say, I'm never going to follow into her footsteps. I'm never going to ever fall into that trap. I'm going to learn her lesson. But they, none of, no, no one in that crowd ever picked up a stone to stone her. Anyway, I got off track. It is not our job to condemn this world. We don't have to. The world has condemned themselves. When people spend eternity in hell, it's because they have doomed themselves by rejecting the gospel message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If one day someone opens their eyes in hell, they better not cuss me out, or any of us Christians. Those who are doomed only have themselves to blame. They have condemned themselves when they rejected the gospel message. Let's get back to Matthew 7.1. We didn't finish the verse. Uh, Matthew 7.1 simply does not say judge not. It actually says judge not that ye be not judged. In other words, Jesus is saying, go ahead and judge, but if you do, be prepared to be judged by the same standard. The next verse, uh, verse 2 says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. That's almost a tongue twister. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Eastern religions call this karma. My English teacher used to call it comeuppance. My mother called it what goes around comes around. My former pastor used to say it this way. He used to say, the chickens have come home to roost. But the Bible more accurately calls it, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In verse 2, we are told that whatever ruler or measuring stick we use to judge someone else, whatever standard we use to judge someone to find them guilty, we will be judged by that same standard. So let's go ahead and judge. Judge all we want. We are free to do so. But before we do, we need to clean up our own lives 
or we will be seen as hypocrites. And it's been in my experience that when we are measured by the same standard that we are measuring someone else, we sometimes don't fare so well. We all got skeletons in our closets. And when we do not fare by, well by our own standard, we are guilty of hypocrisy. Just like the woman caught in adultery, no one in the crowd was sinless. No one picked up a stone to stone her. She was not put to death that day. So Jesus goes on to give us some very good advice. In Matthew 7, 3 to 4, he tells us, By what, by why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider, considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is sticking out of thine own eye. I kind of changed it up there a little bit. Now, we are getting to the meat of Jesus' thought. This five-verse passage in Matthew 7 is less about judgment than it is about hypocrisy. Jesus paints us a picture. You have two brothers. One has a little bitty bitty splinter in his eye. The other has a big two by four sticking out of his skull. Obviously Jesus is speaking an exaggeration here because in reality a man with a board sticking out of his head would certainly die from his injuries. The guy with the telephone pole sticking out of his face goes up to the other guy with a little bitty speck in his eye and he says, you nasty, ignorant slob. You got a speck of wood sticking out of your eye. Ugh, how can you go around looking like that? Ugh, it makes me sick to look at you. Let me get that for you. Let me pull that out before someone else sees it. This would be the same as like, I don't know, Willie Nelson condemning you for smoking weed. It would be like Joan Crawford calling you a bad parent. It would be like Jaja Gabor criticizing you for being divorced. Sorry, I don't have any more timely <laughs> examples because I don't live in the 21st century. I'm still in the 20th century. But I digress. Let's go back to the guy with a railroad tie sticking out of his eye. What does he want to do? Don't miss this. He not only wants to point out that this, his brother has a splinter in his eye, he wants to be the hero. He wants to be the one who pulls the moat out of his brother's eye. Let me pull the moat out of thine eye. In other words, Jesus said it, I mean, the Bible says it best when it says, Physician, heal thyself. It is not the, the guy with the wood beam in his eye. It, it's not that the guy with the beam in his, coming out of his face is wrong, for being concerned about the little splinter in his brother's eye. Certainly, the little, his brother should not have a splinter in his eye. It's not that the beam guy doesn't want to see his brother live a life that's splinter free. He does, and that's fine, and that's all good. It's just that the tiny moat bothers the guy with the beam in his eye. It frustrates him to see his brother's eye and the splinter in it. He, he, how can he call himself my brother? And go around with a splinter in his eye. Why? It's disgraceful. In ra reality, the splinter is so small, nobody can see it unless they're looking for it. However, the telephone pole sticking out of this guy's face, you can see that from space. The beam guy uses his energy not only pointing out his brother's splinter to everyone. He wants to be the one to rid his brother and all of society of his brother's splinter. Meanwhile, this fellow shows no regard for the beam in his own eye. You would think he would use some energy to pull that sucker out. You would think he would have some plan to clean up his own life before he begins judging others, but no. He is more concerned about judging his brother instead. And that's the moral lesson here. Matthew 7, 1 through 5, Jesus is rebuking those who pass judgment on their neighbors, those who would deal deal harshly with others for faults much less significant than the faults they themselves possess. Jesus is saying, and this is good this is where the good advice comes, you know, pray, ask for forgive for forgiveness. Um, clean up your own life, especially in the area you're going to criticize someone else, before you would even dare criticize that person. You need to Get that beam out of your own eye before you approach your brother with a splinter in his eye. Later on in this service, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper table. And we might think that this lesson I just taught has nothing to do with the communion service, but it does. Because we are commanded by God each time we observe the communion supper to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11 says, but let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 
if there's ever a time not to be condemning our brothers and sisters for their sins, it's right before partaking in the communion service. We must reflect on ourselves and only ourselves. We must consider the beam sticking out of our own eyes and not the splinters in our brother's eyes. And we must determine whether there is some unconfessed sin in our hearts that we may be blind to before partaking in the Lord's Supper. And if there is, we need to pray forgiveness from the Lord. In fact, we're not going to be taking communion now for about 20 minutes. we got some other things do, to do while you're in your seat as you're hopefully still listening to me and not dozing off. Just say, Lord, do I have anything I need to confess? Oh, yeah. Lord, I'm sorry about that. And you're good God. And if you mean it, of course. You just don't flippantly tell the Lord you're sorry. But if you mean it, uh, you're good to go with the communion service. The most prominent sin that can keep us from taking the, the bread and the juice today is rejecting Christ. Is there anyone here who is rejecting Christ? Only you know that, and only I know that for myself. You cannot speak for the person sitting next to you. Only you can answer that question. Are you saved? Have you accepted God's gift of his son's death on the cross of Calvary? If you haven't, it's not too late. In the quietness of your own seat this morning, confess to God that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Accept Jesus Christ today. You do. I just bet you do. What's your question? Why would the sesame seed leave the casino? All right, give me a minute. Why would the sesame seed leave the casino? I, you may have stumped me. Because it was on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Never saw that one coming. All right. Thank you very much. If there's nothing further, you then ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's sing two verses because we have, do have communion ahead. Let's sing the first and last verses of number 250. Calvary covers it all. Number 250.
far deeper than all that the world can impart was the message that came to my heart how that Jesus alone for my sin did atone and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with its sin and stain my guilt and despair Jesus took on him there and Calvary covers it all how blessed the thought that my soul by him bought shall be his in the glory on high where with gladness and song I'll be one of the throng and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with its sin and stain my guilt and despair Jesus took on him there and Calvary covers it all our responsive reading should be a familiar one to most of you it comes from John 14 please stand if you're able and comfortable standing I'm going to invite Mrs. Dawn Evans to the pulpit to lead us in this reading let not your heart be troubled Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Thank you. <laughs> I believe that one of the reasons the world is in so much conflict today is because most of the world denies that we can have a better life waiting for us after this one. They would rather stubbornly believe that this earthly life is all there is. And it's their only chance they have at fulfillment and glory and success. They fight to achieve these things. They fight so hard to change these, the circumstances for which they think will be better. I believe the prideful refusal of the coming of the kingdom of God is where much strife begins. Arguments, feuds, even wars are waged not for the sole purpose of defeating the loser, but to bring more power and glory to the winner, to make the winner feel even more revered and better off in this life. I believe evil predators prey upon the weak not to make their prey poorer, but to make themselves richer because they think this is their only chance and time's a-wasting. In short, many behave outside the realms of human decency because they believe this life is all that there is. They have to grab all the gusto they can because they're only going around once. They won't even entertain the thought that there might be a God out there who will judge them one day. They, they'd rather stubbornly deny that there is a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned after they die. They don't want to end up as losers. They have to win at all costs and time's a-wasting. They're getting older. They want to live victorious, wealthy, and even dominating lives here because they believe that this is the only life they have and they demand the best for themselves. They want to be on top, even at the expense of others. But that's the wicked for you in a nutshell, isn't it? To win at all costs, even if others get hurt in their wake. But I also believe that this determination exists among, quote, good people as well. This misconception that they only have one life is why so many well-intentioned good people 
do their level best to make their lives and the world around them cleaner, safer, and more equitable. Not that those things are necessarily bad. Those earthly things are important to us who believe in heaven as well. It's just that sometimes their definitions and their, the means they want to take to make this world cleaner, safer, and more equi equitable don't always match up with our ideals, or better yet, they don't match up with what God would want for this world. We who believe in heaven also strive to make this old world a better place, but not for ourselves, not for our own legacies. We do so mainly for the generations who will come and live in this world after we are gone. We fight for them. We want future Christians and future churches to be successful. We also fight because God made us stewards of this earth, and we want God's blessings upon us for being good stewards of that which he has entrusted to us. But, when all is said and done, in the end, despite whether we Christians fail or if we have even a little bit of success in this old world, we Christians find solace that at the end of our lives, another life awaits. Heaven awaits us. And those poor others, evil intentioned and good intentioned alike, refuse to accept that. That is why they most often arrogantly fight harder than we are prepared to fight, and they fight at all costs. They possess a stubborn pride which they won't let go of, a stubborn pride which we know they must let go of if they are ever to receive eternal life in heaven with us. In a very roundabout way, this brings me to today's sermon. That was just the introduction. Please stay with me. I'll be quick, as quick as I need to be. In Matthew 16, Simon Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds back to Peter. He says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is saying that churches are to be built on the fact that Simon Peter just confessed. The unifying declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, should be the foundation of every church and will be the foundation for the family of God. If we lay the strong foundation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then the gates of hell will, have no, will be no threat against us. And I'm proud to say... And I'm humbled to say, I believe you are sitting in a church which is founded on that principle that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Everything else has been built upon that. You know, we can learn a few things from Jesus' statement to Peter. Amongst them, first, like heaven, hell has gates. Who knew? And second, by using the word prevail, Jesus seems to be implying that hell's gates are offensive, not defensive. Hell's gates can prevail. Hell's gates can attack and overcome that which is on the outside. In short, the gates of hell aren't just acting as a prison, keeping those stubborn souls trapped inside. The gates of hell are acting as a stronghold, keeping the truth of God on the outside. They don't want the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God getting through the gates of hell. They just don't want it. Jesus' description of the gates of hell is what may have led so many old-timers and that old adage that hell is locked from the inside. A few theologians, C.S. Lewis, the main one, in past years have held this interesting philosophy that I still from time to time mull over. I'm still not sure what to make of it when they say hell is locked on the inside. The philosophy is saying that those who occupy hell, those who go to hell, prefer to be locked on the inside and they don't want anyone coming into their hell and preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. Interesting thought. It's not that the occupants of hell want to be in torment for all eternity. It's just that they would rather feel that pain than to have to swallow their pride admit their wrongdoings, and hear one more time how they need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. Could it be that the prideful rejection of Jesus is so willful, so stubborn, so powerful, that it lasts for all eternity? After all, we are told in Proverbs 16, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The scenario would simply be put like this. 
Let me out of hell. Let me out of hell. Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? <sighs> Please stop spouting that Jesus nonsense. On second thought, I'd just rather stay here and burn. That's hard to digest, isn't it? You say, Pastor, is that true? Is it true that's the attitude of the people in hell? I don't know. But I do find it an interesting thought. And I can't really find anything in the Bible that outright contradicts this idea. We are told in the end, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in the end. But I don't know what's going on right now. And when they confess and they kneel, are they kneeling with their hearts? Or are they confess, you know, what's going on there? Yes, it is hard for me to think that this is how the occupants of hell are behaving right now. It's hard for me to think that they are experiencing eternal punishment, yet they have no regret and they make no apologies. They have no excuses. And if they are given a second chance, they would reject Jesus Christ all over again. It's hard to think of them that way. But then I recall the story Jesus told of Lazarus and the rich man. According to this story, what does the rich man in hell ask of Father Abraham? Well, first he asks that Lazarus dip his finger in cold water to cool the rich man's tongue. He's denied that request. The rich man then asks Lazarus to go back to the land of the living and warn his rich brother, the rich brother, the rich man's brothers about hell. The rich man is de denied this request as well. But I always found it interesting, maybe you've never noticed this, maybe you have, that the one thing the rich man in hell never asks for is that he himself be released. Could this mean that the rich man's pride is so vast, so everlasting, that he is still denying Christ as his Savior, even after being locked up in the flames of hell? Again, I don't know. You know, we often think of heaven as the right choice, and hell is the punishment for not making that right choice. But you know what? Maybe hell, like heaven, is a choice all to itself. And that would certainly line up with my own experiences here on this earth as a pastor. If I've heard it once, I've heard this attitude a dozen times. I don't want to go to heaven. I want, I'd rather go to hell and be with my friends. Woo! I know, I'm not really a woo kind of guy. It's better to reign in hell than to be a servant in heaven. While you're up in heaven uh, sitting on your boring cloud and strumming your stupid harp, I'll be parting with the devil. Woo! 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 Well, it's your party and you can die if you want to. <laughs> My point is it all comes down to pride. No matter how it is, no matter how it works, it all comes down to pride. I suppose the sin of pride sends more souls to hell than murder, rape, lies, and thievery combined. Ladies and gentlemen, do me a favor. Let's do all, ourselves a favor. Let's drop the pride. Let us humble ourselves with humility, and admit we can't do this on our own. We cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior. We need, we need someone. We need help. Let's humble ourselves. Let's have some humility and admit we cannot get to heaven without a Savior. Let's drop the pride. By the way, hell isn't the only community to have gates. Heaven has gates too, and they're pearly ones. They must be beautiful. And inside those gates, we get to live with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Forever and ever. On beautiful streets of gold and green pastures and rivers that are bright as crystal. Why wouldn't you want that? Why? Isn't it worth swallowing your pride? Dumping your pride, your, your, your stubbornness. Humbling yourself and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Let's drop our pride. Stop denying Christ. Accept Him today as your Savior. And we can all walk through those heavenly pearly gates together. Amen. Hey, Sophie, stop laughing. Mark's joke wasn't that good. She's got the church giggles back there. Let's sing one verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Number 560 in your hymnals. Blessed be the tie that binds Our hearts in Christian love The fellowship of kindred minds Is like to that above 
Sadly, we do not have a church dinner today. But wasn't that great last week? We have plans to do that again in October. So thank you all for coming and just having a great time as we fellowship together. That was just awesome. At this time, I'm going to ask Brother Mike Thomas to the pulpit to lead us in our closing prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for coming. I hope you have a great week. You are dismissed.